Hi, I'm David Ross and welcome to episode 8 and a special edition of The Sun's new podcast, Israel's War on Terror. As Israel navigates its response to Hamas's October 7th massacre, many are wondering how to deal with the Iran question. The Tehran regime, and in particular the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, or IRGC, stands accused of orchestrating and funding the activity of terror groups across the Middle East. Kasra Arabi is the director of IRGC Research at United Against Nuclear Iran and non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C. He says the IRGC's involvement in events like October 7 are extremely significant. This is really important to understand. So if we take a step back for context, so the relationship between Hamas and the regime in Iran really started to flourish in the early 1990s where Israel expelled Hamas into Lebanon. Hamas militants were trained at the Hezbollah University, and this included suicide uh, bombing training, but also a delegation of Hamas militants were sent to Tehran to undergo missile training by none other than the Iranian regime's so-called godfather uh, of their ballistic missile program, IRGC commander uh, Tehrani Mogaddam. Since then, we have seen this relationship grow closer, and particularly in recent times, if we look at 2021, for example, uh, we see that the regime in Iran, via its Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, which controls these terrorist militias, this network of terrorist militias that the regime in Iran controls, creates a joint command room in southern Lebanon in 2021, where it places Hamas alongside Hezbollah, its most important uh, proxy. So what we have here, and we have to make this absolutely clear, the IRGC is the principal supporter of Hamas militarily, financially, logistically, in terms of armaments. But not only that, it has played a key role in soft power operations for Hamas. For example, uh, creating centers for Hamas in Gaza for the recruitment and radicalization of young men for, for Hamas. But as well as that, we see even in the plans to reconstruct Gaza, to house Hamas missiles and civilian buildings, the Revolutionary Guard, the IRGC, was the mastermind behind that. So how much involvement would the IRGC have in the actual ordering of the October 7th massacre? This attack, this terrorist attack that took place on October 7th, simply could not have taken place without not only the green light of the IRGC, but the strategic coordination at the planning level. We know there have been multiple reports, there has been multiple intelligence reports stating that this attack, this terrorist attack, was in the making for over a year. We know that Esmail Ghani, the IRGC's Buts Force commander, the successor of Ghassim Soleimani, has made multiple trips across the Middle East, mobilizing these actors, bringing together Hamas, Hezbollah, together in one room to uh, strategically coordinate its assets. As well as that, in the past year particularly, we have seen changes to the Revolutionary Guard, the IRGC's structures, doctrines, uh, personnel, all of which was geared towards confrontation with Israel, even by the way, and this was completely mis misreported, the so-called China-Iran-Saudi deal. The IRGC's motivations, Ayatollah Khamenei's motivations for that deal was not peace in the Middle East. Rather, it was tactically delaying confrontation with a lesser enemy, Riyaz, the Al Sauds, to pivot the regime's resources, the regime's assets, towards confrontation with the greater enemy, Israel. The IRGC has an official policy of quote, eradicating the state of Israel. And we have seen the Houthis, for example, being very active, de facto opening another front against Israel. We've seen in a Houthi 
uh, hijacking of a vessel. We've seen Houthi ballistic missiles being fired at Israel. So this plan has been long in the works. We have to make that absolutely clear. You know, I don't have a crystal ball. I've published on this extensively prior to in, in June, in April, stating the Revolutionary Guard, if you monitor the changes to its doctrine, if you monitor the changes to its personnel, is preparing for a major confrontation with Israel. And we've seen that. We're witnessing this right now. By the way, the IRGC sees this as the beginning. The IRGC sees the October 7th attacks as the beginning of a longer confrontation with Israel. Its doctrine is built around making Israel bleed slowly over time. This is a war of attrition. They've been open in saying that, by the way. So in my view, there is absolutely no doubt that the Revolutionary Guard, the IRGC, had a key role in planning the October 7th terrorist attacks. Anyone who states otherwise is either, does, either doesn't understand the IRGC or is deliberately taking the decision for political reasons not to hold Tehran accountable because once you hold Tehran accountable, you have to put in consequences on it. Um, and at the moment, it seems the West doesn't have the political appetite to do so. Because from the outside looking in, it's a bit confusing that Shias and Sunnis would, would unite, albeit for, for the goal of, of annihilation uh, of Israel. But tell us a little bit more about the background of that ideology. Sure. So the, the ideology of the uh, Revolutionary Guard, the IRGC, is deeply anti-Semitic, extremely anti-Semitic. Um, and the deep anti-Semitism is part of the glue that binds these Islamist extremist organizations together. Uh, it's why Hamas, despite being a Sunni Islamist extremist group, is part of the IRGC's so-called axis of resistance. And by the way, because of the October 7th terrorist attacks, it's going to play a much more prominent role for Tehran in this axis of resistance, all of which, by the way, is geared towards encircling Israel and moving towards confrontation. These militants across the axis of resistance, and I've studied and obtained the internal training manuals the IRGC uses to radicalize its recruits as well as proxies. These state that Israel must be eradicated. And the key thing that they state, by the way, is they are teaching their recruits to wage armed jihad against Christians, Zoroastrians, and Jews on the basis that they, quote, have unacceptable faith and must either convert to Islam or be executed. Now, there's another dimension of this indoctrination program. By the way, the IRGC's indoctrination program, training ideological radicalization, makes up more than 50% of training in the IRGC. I mean, that's unparalleled. We don't see that. It's, it's because of the nature of the IRGC. The IRGC operates no differently to other prescribed Islamist extremist entities, from ISIS al-Qaeda to, to Hezbollah, which it created. But to, since 2009, the IRGC's focused on a particular doctrine that it's been radicalizing its members and their families. And this is the militaristic doctrine of Mahdiism. Now, Amongst Islamist ideologies, the militaristic doctrine of Mahdism is the most extremist doctrine. Uh, it's a Shia doctrine primarily, but because of how extreme it is, we actually see ISIS al-Qaeda using it as part of radicalization. So this doctrine is all centered around the return of the so-called hidden imam, who Shia Muslims believe was withdrawn into a state of disappearance, miraculous state of disappearance by God in 874 AD. One day he will return, bringing justice to the world. He will reappear. To do this, by the way, according to Shia, historic Shia narrations, he will return with an army of 313 commanders that will wage a war against the infidels, the non-Muslims. And prior to his arrivals, prior to Mahdi's arrival, prior to the hidden imam's arrival, there will be an apocalyptic war where Jews worldwide will be eradicated and killed. Now, 
the IRGC since 2009 has been indoctrinating its recruits on the basis that the IRGC is the militaristic vehicle to speed up Mahdi's return. Because they have been communicating and radicalizing their recruits and stating that there are barriers to the hidden imam's return. The biggest barrier, they claim, is the existence of the state of Israel. And they draw again on these Shia historic narrations that prior to his arrival, all Jews across the world will be eradicated. We've seen that the IRGC double down on this Mahdiist doctrine, so much so that right now the October 7 terrorist attacks across the board, by the way, not just in relation to the IRGC, across the axis of resistance is being communicated as the first step towards Mahdi's arrival. So the first step towards the eradication of the state of Israel, going back to that long war of attrition. So really, this is an ideology that is extremely anti-Semitic. Um, these fighters that they have recruited and radicalized across the board, so obviously Hamas, is not the same as Hezbollah. Hezbollah was created by the IRGC from scratch. It is the gold standard proxy for the Revolutionary Guard, one that where the IRGC directs complete command and control. Hamas is slightly different. However, it is reliant on the IRGC to orchestrate such an attack, such a terrorist attack on that scale. The IRGC will have been involved um, heavily um, and the intelligence points to that and that involvement does that mean in terms of the actual makeup of the horrific crimes because there was a level of brutality seen here that was very isis reminiscent it seems that the message if it is a direction has been make this as sickening as possible to scare to intimidate what was the reasoning behind that level of brutality and the taking of hostages as part of it? A lot of people have been surprised by this. Um, but look, these are violent Islamist extremists that are radicalized to the core. Um, so when you see these scenes, they are extremely horrific, of course. But the individuals connecting the, conducting them are violent Islamist extremists. We shouldn't be surprised um, by the level of brutality. We've seen this elsewhere. We saw this in Syria. We've seen this inside of Iran. The regime in Iran brutally murdering the Iranian people using the most extreme uh, forms of torture, sexual assault, um, really, really horrific stuff. And look, on the hostages as well, we're talking about an entity, the IRGC, that helped Hamas reconstruct buildings, civilian buildings, schools, hospitals, mosques, um, community centers, with the goal of storing missiles. So using civilians to protect missiles. Um, this was part of the IRGC Glutz Forces strategy. They deployed this in 2006 in southern Lebanon. They created the Reconstruction Committee for Lebanon, headed by IRGC Blitz Force Commander Hassan Shatari. Shatari went in, rebuilt the southern Lebanon, and he was very open about this. It's in his memoirs in Farsi. They went in, they built, they went into a village. They would see that the children were playing football. He states this openly. He would command, build a football academy there, and we'll use the football academy to recruit and radicalize soldiers for Hezbollah. We'll recruit and radicalize soldiers for the Islamic revolution. As well as this, Shatari, as I've said, reconstructed buildings in southern Lebanon with the sole purpose of housing missiles for Hezbollah. In 2008, they sought to replicate this in Gaza. They created the Reconstruction Committee for Gaza. And obviously, geographically, it's very different. The IRGC couldn't deploy its bulldozers and its cranes and its engineers uh, into Gaza. However, at the strategic planning level, it provided the basis, the plan for Hamas to reconstruct buildings with the sole purpose of housing missiles 
in civilian buildings, making it much harder for Israel to target Hamas positions and also making it much harder for, their, for the Israelis to target Hamas positions with minimal loss to civilian life. This is all part of the IRGC strategy because it plays into the Revolutionary Guard psychological warfare doctrine, where not only is it harder for Israel to strike Hamas positions, but the Revolutionary Guard is able to win the psychological war, the information war. And we've seen this in the current ongoing conflict um, where Israel, and it's a big part of this is centered around disinformation. You remember the so-called strike on the hospital, which ended up being an Islamic Jihad failed missile. Even though this was discounted, even though it was proven by multiple governments, including the Canadian government, stating that this was not an Israeli strike, the damage was done because mainstream media outlets covered this, took Hamas at face value, what they said. And as far as the Revolutionary Guard was concerned, it had won the information war, it had won the psychological war. So that's part of the reason why they house missiles in civilian buildings, obviously using civilians as human shields uh, for, for their missiles, both to protect Hamas assets, making it harder for Israel to strike and I strike these assets, and also to play into the psychological war and win that psychological war. And unfortunately, look, if you were the IRGC right now and you're seeing hundreds of thousands of people in the West take to the streets and portray Israel as the aggressor, even though Israel was clearly the victim of the October 7th terrorist attacks, you know, the IRGC would be very happy to see these scenes. And, you know, it goes back to understanding the nature of these violent Islamist extremist organizations, because that's what they are. Of course, it's a completely perverse strategy, but these are terrorist organizations. Organizations require finance. How does the funding actually work? So the IRGC is the principal supporter financially of Hamas. And there are a myriad of ways where they evade sanctions, uh, where they facilitate the transfer of funds to Hamas. This ranges from cryptocurrencies, which we know Israel has tried to target, um, take down. But cryptocurrencies are a major area where the IRGC actually has been pretty open that that's a, a key way, a key mechanism for us to evade sanctions and supply, um, supply finances to terrorist organizations like, like Hamas. But they also rely heavily on traditional forms uh, of, of transfers, particularly Havala banking, uh, where you have point persons in different countries and these individuals literally facilitate and transfer funds, making it really hard to trace uh, and identify the source. Beyond that, we have accounts of senior Hamas officials when they have visited Tehran and met with the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei at the airport, bags of cash, millions of dollars worth of cash has been uh, handed over to them. There was a particular account where Qasem Soleimani, the late IRGC Blitz Force commander, literally handed a suitcase full of millions of dollar notes to senior Hamas officials where they took that back to Gaza um, to fund these terrorist organizations. As well as that, we have, as you know, which has been a lot of reporting on this, a very sophisticated underground network uh, of tunnels in, in Gaza. And again, at the strategic planning level, who was responsible for this sophisticated tunnel network? The IRGC's Blitz Force, the late Qasem Soleimani and Imad Mourinia, the, the former uh, Hezbollah terror chief. They played a key role in the strategic planning, providing Hamas with the knowledge to build and construct such a sophisticated tunnel network, which we know the Israelis are trying to neutralize. This underground tunnel network has facilitated the transfer of armaments, funds, etc. So you have a myriad of mechanisms that the IRGC has created to enable the transfer of funds. And, you know, the West has to do much more to curb and push back and counter um, the IRGC's ability to make such payments. If we look at sanctions, for example, right now, so we know that annually we're talking around the hundred million dollars annually support to to Hamas. But recently in the past year, we know that that's been increased to 350 million. Now, part of this goes down to the pressure 
or lack of pressure on the IRGC and the regime in Iran's ability to export oil, for example. So although sanctions are still in place against the regime in Iran, they're not being enforced rigorously. And we see that the IRGC, the regime in Iran, is exporting oil, averaging around 2 million barrels of oil per day, which is way above what they are allowed to export under the current sanctions regime, which is not being enforced. It's almost at levels, pre-sanction levels. We again can join the dots together. Since January 2021, where we've seen this increase of um, oil exports, access to funds, we've seen increased payments to Hezbollah, We've seen increased payments to Hamas. And these are all mechanisms that have enabled the October 7th terrorist attack. So enforcing sanctions is one mechanism that the West has at its disposal to curb the regime's ability to fund uh, these terrorist, terrorist organizations. If the end goal is the annihilation of Israel, you have a situation whereby Israel is caught up in, in a military action in Gaza trying to wipe out Hamas. Why hasn't Iran directed its proxies to all launch full-scale attacks at the same time to really stretch Israel? Clearly there is activity on the Lebanon border, but there hasn't been quite the multi-pronged attack that some predicted. Well, the first thing to note is that the IRGC's whole doctrine and the doctrine of these all these uh, terrorist organizations is based on asymmetric warfare. Uh, and a war of attrition. We saw this in Iraq. We saw this in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, the Taliban deployed this against the US-led coalition. A war of attrition, they believe they have time on their side. These are not democratic countries. They're not accountable to anyone. Um, and they believe that they can launch a war of attrition and come out on top. Uh, because in the West, particularly, you know, we have democracies uh, and um, you know, public uh, view, public pressure, uh, doesn't you know, enable that you know we've got a long long amount of time here and we, we, we're not accountable to our people. So that's part of this. But if we actually examine what the IRGC has been doing, now all the focus has been on whether Hezbollah is going to enter the, the, the war. And you know the Revolutionary Guard, the regime in Iran has consistently, and it's still doing so by the way, threatening a multi-front attack. Now, while all attention has been on Hezbollah in Lebanon, the IRGC has created a network of proxy terror groups in Syria and in Iraq, and we have seen quite a lot of significant activity there. Uh, the IRGC, particularly in Syria. So in Syria and Iraq now, we've seen more than 60 attacks uh, against US assets. Um, we've only seen uh, one or two now, maybe. It's not been confirmed, uh, US responses to, to those attacks. Where this doctrine is built around is making this a long war making it a war of attrition, even if the current escalation, the current conflict between Hamas and Israel settles down, we can be sure that the IRGC and its network of proxies will, uh, in the not, to not so distant future, wage uh, another form of attack on Israel. This is all built around that long confrontation. They've been opening stating that. Um, and it's all about mobilizing and creating better coordination between the so-called axis of resistance and moving towards that path. It's a slow journey. It's a long journey. But until the US and the West impose direct consequences on the regime in Iran, targeting the IRGC, whether that's in the region, and making it very clear, by the way, that if this escalation continues, IRGC assets inside of Iran are legitimate targets. Until the IRGC believes that the West has no, no appetite to impose consequences on it, this uh, trajectory of escalation is going to continue. Um, and it paints a very, very worrying picture. Uh, the, the, the activity in Syria, for example, the IRGC has created two heavily armed, heavily indoctrinated proxy groups that are made up of extremely anti-Semitic militants who are motivated by the goal of eradicating the state of Israel. It's mobilizing these groups towards the border of Israel. Esmail Ghani, the IRGC Blitz Force commander, has now created a joint war room on the border on Golan Heights, on the Israeli-Syria border. We're consistently seeing strikes from these proxies against US positions. Um, and these militants 
are moving towards the border of Israel to the beat of the Mahdiist drum, believing that the eradication of the state of Israel will facilitate the re return of the hidden imam, viewing it through that prism. Extremely dangerous uh, situation, extremely fragile situation. And really, I believe we're moving towards a period of escalation and confrontation in the Middle East uh, that we've not witnessed before. Extremely worrying. And until consequences are not directly imposed, until we don't see consequences being imposed directly on Tehran, this will continue. And how does that become even more concerning when you take into account Tehran's desire for nuclear proliferation? How do you see that playing out? It's a very, very uh, key question. Very, very disturbing. Now, while all attention, rightfully, has been on the terrorist attacks on Israel, and while the US is consumed by the ongoing conflict in Israel and also Ukraine, we have a situation in Tehran where the nuclear program is moving closer and closer towards weaponization. The regime in Iran is now enriching 60% en masse. Uh, the IAEA, the Atomic Energy Agency, the UN's Atomic Energy Agency, has found traces of 83% uh, enriched uranium, particles of 83% enriched uranium. There has been a live debate amongst the senior clerics and the IRGC that now may be the best time to move towards North Koreaization of the nuclear program. In other words, um, weaponizing. And if that scenario were to take place, I mean, first of all, I mean, make, let's make it absolutely clear. Israel has made it explicitly clear that it will not tolerate a nuclear armed Islamic Republic of Iran, rightfully so, because that would be an existential threat to the state of Israel. Um, the US has also made it clear. Now, at the moment, what's driving this calculus, what's driving the IRGC's calculus is that every time they have escalated, whether that be terrorism, whether that be assassinations or assassination plots on British soil across Europe, um, whether that be increasing the nuclear program, the West has not imposed effective consequences. It's not imposed consequences on the regime in Iran. And let's make it absolutely clear, by the way, the IRGC controls the nuclear program. Um, so the, 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 the regime in Iran believes the West has zero appetite for any form of confrontation with it. And that itself is not leading to de-escalation. So Western inaction, the West desire to sit at the negotiating table with Tehran, that's not de-escalating tensions, it's escalating it because it's led to an overinflated sense of confidence in Tehran amongst the IRGC. And they're pretty open about it. They've said the West, the US, is scared of us now. We have the upper hand. We control the path towards escalation. We've provided a strategic roadmap towards escalation. The next step being a multi-front attack. How has the West responded? Instead of tiptoeing around this plan for escalation, the IRGC's plan for escalation, the West needs to take back control and enforce and impose consequences directly on Tehran, directly on the IRGC. If that doesn't happen, we're going to move towards escalation, not only on the terror front, not only in relation to Israel, but also on the nuclear program. And although for you know our, your viewers today, this may seem like a very far away problem. It's not. We have seen uh, more than 15 plots, terror plots, take place on British soil. IRGC attempts to conduct terror attacks against British citizens, particularly from the Iranian diaspora and the Jewish community, the two prime targets of IRGC terrorism. As well as this, they have sought to nurture homegrown Islamist radicalization, homegrown Islamist terrorism in the UK via their centers using tactics like ISIS al-Qaeda. But because the IRGC hasn't been prescribed as a terrorist organization, the current sanctions regime on it, 
does not prohibit its ability to disseminate jihadi propaganda. Um, so prescribing the IRGC is the lever that the British government has. It's not yet used, despite all the evidence there. Um, but it has that lever and it must use it, not least to protect Britain's homeland security, British national security and uh, British, British citizen, particularly, as I said, from the Iranian diaspora community and, and the Jewish community. So if you were advising Joe Biden and, and Rishi Sunak, what would you be telling them would be the most effective solution to this crisis? So there are, as I said, multiple policy levers. The US needs to push the Europeans, needs to push the Brits to prescribe the IRGC as the very least mechanism to impose consequences on the regime in Iran. The US needs to create a united front with the Europeans. And let me make it absolutely clear, it has to impose consequences directly on the IRGC. And that means, by the way, targeting IRGC assets, IRGC bases, not only in the region, not only in the Middle East, but also in Iran. Um, and I say this as an Iranian diaspora member, targeting the IRGC's assets in Iran is not an attack on Iran. It's not an attack on the Iranian people. It's targeting the very people, the very bases that are murdering the Iranian people on the streets, that murdered Mahsa Amini last year, murdered Nika, uh, mur murdered Mohammad Reza. The only way escalation in the region can be stopped, can be prevented, is by imposing consequences on the IRGC to change its calculus. At present, it believes it can get away with this escalation because the US and the Europeans have no appetite to take action against it. Um, that's the only way we can lead to a situation where we see de-escalation in the region uh, rather than escalation. Because if that's not, if that doesn't take place, then as I said, unfortunately, I believe we're moving towards a very, very um, volatile uh, situation in the Middle East where this conflict, it has, it has already spread, um, but it's going to get a lot worse if we don't impose consequences on the regime in Iran. How likely do you think those consequences will be applied in a Biden administration versus, let's say, a Trump administration? I think the US uh, administration has stood firm with Israel uh, and made it absolutely clear that it stands with Israel. Um, and, and Biden has done that well. However, there have been aspects to the Biden administration's policy, of course, where, you know, if you're trying to target Hamas, if you're trying to target Hezbollah, and yet you're unfreezing $6 billion worth of assets or, uh, and providing $6 billion to the regime in Iran, then obviously that's an inconsistent policy. I believe the US doesn't currently have uh, an, an effective Iran policy. Um, does it even have an Iran policy is, 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 is the question. I think with the former administration, we saw that the former administration made it absolutely clear that targeting US citizens was its red line. That took place in December by the IRGC's proxies in Iraq. And the former president, uh, Trump, responded by targeting Qasem Soleimani, uh, the IRGC's Quds Force commander responsible for managing the proxy terror network. That deterred the Islamic Republic of Iran. That shocked them to its core. And the thing I want to point out here is we see that the enrichment en masse that's taking place right now did not take place under the former administration. So even though Trump withdrew from the 2015 nuclear deal, um, and in my view, you know, a lot of people like to make this about Trump and disdain for Trump, but the decision to walk away from the nuclear agreement was a perfectly legitimate one because the sanctions relief that the regime in Iran was getting, by the way, had led to an escalation in the region, in the number of terrorist attacks. They had, when we see sanctions being uh, lifted on the regime in Iran, 
we see a rise in the number of IRGC proxies in the region. These proxies in 2015, uh, 2016 were created on the basis, were, were, were recruited, radicalized uh, their militants on the basis that they were going to go towards um, a final battle with Israel. And at the time, everyone dismissed this as, pro as propaganda. Today, we see that that's much closer to, to reality. So we see that after the Soleimani strike, the regime in Iran was deterred and the escalation on the nuclear front only takes place once the new administration takes office and states its intent to go back to the nuclear agreement. So from January 2021, we see the regime in Iran moves beyond 5% enrichment and now it's enriching at 60% en masse. This regime is not deterred. The US has to find a way of regaining deterrence. And that's what this is about. Now, how likely is this to take place under the current administration? It's a hard question, but you know we are working tirelessly uh, to expose the Islamic Republic's nefarious activities in the hope that the US takes back control um, and enforces serious consequences on the IRGC. Because until that doesn't happen, you know, until we don't see this, we're going to be moving towards escalation rather than de-escalation. And that's, you know, that's at the heart of this. You, the West, the US, the Europeans need to change the IRGC's calculus if they are genuinely interested in de-escalation, which they are, of course. But we need to be realistic here. And until Tehran does not feel the consequences, that trajectory of escalation is going to continue. And there'll be more attacks. There'll be more October 7th attacks. Um, this was Israel's 9-11 moment. And the reaction, unfortunately, particularly, I mean, part of the problem has been the reporting on it. Part of the problem has been the broader reaction. Right now, I believe that the governments have done a good job standing with Israel. But if we want a period of de-escalation, de we need to target uh, the mastermind, the strategic mastermind behind all of these uh, attacks. And that is the Revolutionary Guard in, in Iran. Kasra Arabi there. And that brings an end to this week's episode of Israel's War on Terror. You can search for more instalments wherever you typically get your podcasts. Please let us know in the comments if you've any questions you'd like us to answer, and we'll do our best to take them on in the coming weeks. Thanks for listening.